Hello, you're listening to Shorthand, a guide to making a short film, a BFI Network and Film Hub Southeast podcast. Whether you're actively making a short film or passively thinking about it, this is a podcast designed to help you on the journey from coming up with a compelling short film idea to editing it into a finished product. Applications for the BFI Network Short Film Fund open on the 14th of March, which is still plenty of time to finesse that script you're working on and find a team that want to make it with you. And we've created a podcast that will provide some pointers on doing exactly that. In this first episode, we're asking, what is story? How do you write something that surprises yet fulfills the person reading and hopefully later watching it? How do you write authentic dialogue and create meaningful characters and leave an impact all within around 10 minutes? And moreover, as storytellers, how do you interrogate your work, yourself, and then convince other people to come on board? When I'm starting to think of uh, ideas for films and I have a sort of kernel of an idea, my main way of developing the story is... Well, I rely quite a lot on my like subconscious to do the work for me. I always figure that if a story is really good or if a character or a moment is really good, it will come back to me. So as a creative person, obviously you have ideas all the time and there has to be an element of filter. So I use the kind of boomerang. If the idea could keep you coming back, then, then it's probably a good one. That's Lucy Bryden, the writer and director of the 2020 feature film Body of Water and the screenwriter of short films So It Goes and Babe. Lucy also leads the screenwriting course on the University of Warwick's creative writing programme. Here, she talks us through what exactly a story is, how you build a premise into a story, and whether short films should adhere to a certain structure or can afford to be a bit more playful. In terms of going beyond a premise, it's useful to sort of sit and just sort of, once you've got a key idea or an image or a person that you're interested in, just to sort of push it around like a sculptor I guess with clay like just sort of play with it and in in terms of developing and and sort of leaning into and and getting beyond cliches because that's where our brains tend to go initially is usually kind of like the obvious place which is the cliche place so just brainstorming and pushing ideas around is how I get it to the next stage of thinking okay this could work as something bigger than just an idea to me as a storyteller stories themselves are or sort of acts of transformation it's a kind of process of alchemy there are elements that combine and then you come out at the end with a different thing or with a different feeling identifying those really interesting moments in a character's life particularly in short form if you can identify even a small moment that might have a huge impact on the lives of the characters you're talking about regardless of genre I think that's a really good place to start Short films, in my experience, do tend to have a structure, whether it's intentional or not, because that tends to be the way that we absorb narratives. There there does tend to be a shape that is a sort of proposition, a setup of a story, and then a point of crisis or a point of reckoning, and then a, a conclusion. And those sort of big, you know, big temples of stories do tend to run uh, true, even in short form. However, the difference being to my mind, that is to do with the length of time you spend in each in each part of this the structure. So set up in a short is usually really short because <laughs> the, the clue is in the name. You don't have time to spend getting to know characters. So your story's got to be about something else. It's got to be about a, a spectacle or a moment or a, a transformation. There is a sort of stru- a, a loose structure, but it's a lot more malleable. And the length of those moments, you know, it, uh, length of those sections can vary quite su- substantially. Whereas in longer form, they do tend to be a bit more even. I think short films offer the opportunity to to try you know, different formats and be quite bold in a way that features can't because there's just some ideas that are best sustained in a short form. One short film I think is really successful is a film called Cracked and I think it was directed by Trim Lamba and I show it to my students because it's it it uses the Snapchat format and it has a young woman who's talking to camera a lot, she's very confident and then she has a acid thrown in her face and it sort of like shows her mental disintegration uh through this style and then at the end there's a sort of shift in the camera from being this sort of subjective to an objective shot of her as she's sort of going back out into the world to me that felt like so credible and interesting and relevant and believable but it also at the same time felt really 
innovative and was just a, a completely different way of, of, of playing that story. Next up, Lucy talks to us about exercising restraint, but allowing the free-flowing, overwriting first draft to be a part of the process, as well as how she writes authentic characters and endings that land. My general habit as a writer is to accept the fact that I will usually, in the first draft, massively overwrite everything, especially dialogue. And it was a kind of hard, hard learned lesson when I was making short films that I would watch them back in the edit and even after they've been through this process, like I'd be like, wow, there's just way too much dialogue. And I don't, I, don't, I don't think that's an uncommon experience. But just acknowledging that and understanding your own process can actually really help with this. Because I think if you just say, right, well, the first draft is going to be very verbal. It's going to be less original because you've got to mine, as I said earlier, through the cliches to get to the really good stuff. So I think knowing that's part of my process and knowing that it's redrafting, redrafting, redrafting is going to get you to the refined, exciting underbelly of the initial idea, which is where you want to be. To me, exercising restraint is almost like the editing process, I would say, because there should, I also feel strongly that there should be a, a layer of, of writing that isn't restrained, that you're not going in, because that to me ends up in writer's block. And that's what I hear from a lot of young writers is when they say, oh, I've got so many ideas, and but they, they're already overanalyzing their own ideas before they've even written them down. And I'm like, but that I've never touched with suffer from writer's book because I just feel like, well, it doesn't matter what I put down as long as I put it down and then I can play with it and no one ever has to see it. And also just making sure you take steps once you've got your initial idea down to kind of think about it in terms of what do the frames of this scene look like? Like, what are the images that are going to put it together? Because we are working in a visual medium if we think about that stuff early on it just it will undoubtedly enhance the quality of the finished piece so during the development of body of water I, I i was writing regular pieces for little white lies about the process and one of those talked a bit about um how you break down a script and, and build it up again i tend to say this to my students that a, a screenplay is like a manual right it's a manual for a bunch of other creative people as well as yourself, if you're a writer director anyway, to create a collective project. So it's, in that sense, it's a very, it's a, obviously a hugely different form of writing to poetry or prose or whatever. So the process of writing to me is, you know, I finish, I finish the script on my own on my computer and then I end up having to, you know, sit in a room with a bunch of actors and producers and sort of explain it and talk it through and read it out. At that stage, you know, that's when you'll get a lot of questions um, particularly from actors about character intention and desire and subtext. And that is also going to force you to question, you know, ask questions of the work itself because you don't necessarily know all the answers. And that's the other thing that nobody tells you is, you know, you will sometimes get like people asking you questions about your own work and you're like, actually, I don't, I don't really know what I meant by that. Not, not all, often you do, but sometimes they'll be like, I actually just like the way it sounded or I like the way it felt for this person to sort of do this thing, but there was no big deep meaning into, in it. So that's sort of what I meant by the building it back up again, being interrogated and also by producers asking you, well, you know, do you need this extra location? Do you need, you know, this sort of car or whatever, you know, that's the stuff that you really have to then drill into and be like, do I actually need it? What is it adding to my story? You know, does it really need to be there? You know, if you can make a script lower budget, then that always just sort of helps you get things moving. And in terms of how writers can interrogate their work and pull it apart, I, I, th I always say go to other writers. Like writers love talking about writing and a lot of them actually love performing. So sometimes it's really useful to get a bunch of writers or even get if you have friends who are in performance, like get them together, do read throughs and hear, hear your script read aloud. It's something I do with my students a lot. And they always seem to get a lot out of it and really enjoy it, actually, which is, you know, we should be enjoying this stuff. Make sure you get, get a stage where you're able to read it out and, and preferably record it so that you can play it back. Some exercises that writers can do to, to give their characters authenticity, I find useful, are one, to write a letter from the point of view of the character to another character, but about something high stakes, so probably at like one of your climatic, dramatic moments. No holds barred, as intimate as possible, and drawing on, you know, as everyone does when they argue, drawing on things that have happened in the past or historical things that have happened between these two people, that will really take you deep into like that relationship or any key relationship. 
The other thing you can do is just sort of is write a monologue from their perspective with a similar sort of slant, like thinking about something high stakes that this person feels really passionate about. And that this can build on the other sort of really imperative things that you need to do when you're you're building character which is you know like a character questionnaire bio type thing like you know when did they have their first kiss all this sort of stuff that can have incredible ripple effects across your life that you do you might not even be cognizant of yourself when you spend that much time and look at characters in that way and from their and look at everything from their perspective then I think that really helps bed in the authenticity endings are incredibly difficult and we all know that feeling of when we're sat in the cinema or wherever watching something and it's like, oh. <laughs> so I think what's always really important to hold on to if you're a bit lost is how do I want to leave the audience or well, I suppose in our case, sometimes the reader feeling at the end. And that can be a really good steer in terms of what you do practically or plot wise, like, because we are dealing in emotions and films, you know, filmmaking is about emotional movement in your audience. And that's what we should be thinking about that. That can be a guide. And then it's not necessarily to do with predictability, but it's to do with, okay, I, I, I know what I'm trying to create. And finally, Lucy gives her recommendations for books that might help you on your own writing journey. My two favourite books on writing are, they're both called On Writing, actually, and they're by Margaret Atwood and Stephen King. And they are incredibly useful for writers across different genres and types of writing. They will really help you and, and understand and help you understand also that you're not crazy for trying to do this, which is part of the thing. So I would start with those if you haven't already read them. And the other one I think is, is wonderful is John York's Into the Woods, which is a bit more, you know, directly tied to screenwriting because of John's background. It, it goes into a lot of detail and a lot of the lessons he gives there can be applied to both feature scripts and short scripts, but also maybe television too. So it's a really good all rounder. And I think it's good to sort of build, build a sense of like storytelling across different lengths from quite an early stage. As a script editor, I'd work with a writer maybe from idea stage all the way up to a draft that's ready to shoot. So yeah, it's working on the script to get it to a, the best place possible that it can be made basically. And that would involve having lots and lots of in-depth chats and asking lots and lots of questions and interrogating sort of everything in the script everything conceptually you know about the the idea itself uh, to sort of nitty-gritty structural questions of you know looking at character arc and turning points and reading all the drafts of everything and giving uh notes uh on on all of those things and some emotional hand-holding too the things that a script editor isn't there to do is definitely not to write your script for you. Definitely not there to take a writing credit. They are, I would say, generally not there necessarily to find solutions for you, but to help guide you towards your own solutions and to hopefully ask the right questions that will sort of bring about that kind of aha moment. That's Jess Jones, a freelance script editor working across shorts and features for BFI, BBC and Channel 4, among many other places. She helps storytellers tease out and harness the distinctive ideas in their scripts, and here she offers her take on common weaknesses with early drafts. There are definitely some issues that I, that I see all the time with first drafts. The biggest thing I would say is that they're trying to say or do too many things really in a short film you can only do or say kind of one main thing if you have too many ideas floating around and you're trying to say too many different things then more often than not what ends up happening is everything gets a little bit muddy and you end up not really saying anything at all another one i see a lot is people are very keen on the idea of ambiguity in their in their writing and that that seems like kind of like a cool thing to try and strive for that like it's really ambiguous and I don't want to like spoon feed the audience the meaning I mean ambiguity is not all it's cracked up to be uh, in any way uh and I would try and avoid ambiguity because really if we think about the stories that affect us and that have kind of stood the test of time we know what they're about and why we should care there's a place for ambiguity but it has to be really intentional you have to kind of 
be deliberately using ambiguity to achieve a certain effect. Another thing I see a lot is not effectively dramatizing, particularly where people are telling personal stories, uh, you know, which is a great thing to do and definitely write what you know. But there's a funny thing that can happen that even where something has been sort of quote unquote dramatic in our life, that it won't immediately translate onto the page as dr- as dramatic or or dramatic in in story terms there has to be a, an element of sort of distancing yourself from perhaps the real events that happen to you and creating a new story and new character that sort of speaks to those events in a truthful way but not necessarily in a factual way and then The last one, I think, is writing from the outside in rather than from the inside out, by which I mean looking at something that already exists, like an, an action film, say, and saying, I want to write an action film and then going about sort of creating from, yeah, from the from the outside of like going to an action film and then I need to find a character that's going to be in this action action film and they're going to do all these cool action sequences, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Rather than, I think, organically allowing a story to exist inside of you and then sort of be brought forth onto the page. And I think, you know, that might look like staying with stories or characters for a while and kind of you know writing down observations and snippets of conversation and you know other references whether it's music or something you've read and uh all, you know all of these things sort of allowing that to sort of like percolate and inform a story and I think that all of those things help to bring out a part of you and put that into the story and give the story a kind of sense of a sense of you a sense of voice when you're assessing scripts that's what you're always looking for dialogue is really hard (laughs) so I feel like people should know that first off the bat and that if they're struggling with dialogue it's not because they're just getting it wrong dialogue is really hard to nail particularly in, in film the tendency is always to overwrite dialogue and that's a point of weakness that 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 comes up in in early scripts you know i always like to say to writers to use dialogue as a last resort if you cannot come up with a single other way to communicate what it is that you're trying to say then and only then can you use dialogue. You should be looking for ways to dramatise subtext, meaning relationships, feelings, rather than speaking them. So I think there are a few things that you can do to sort of help hone that skill and be aware that writing dialogue and and nailing subtext is going to be a skill that that you hone over you know many scripts so one thing I think that can be helpful is to listen to conversations listen to how people speak listen for what you think might be unsaid because often that's that's the kind of that's where the like juicy subtext is it's you know it's where there's like a tension or an opposition between what someone is saying versus what you know, their body is doing or the emotional circumstances in which that conversation is taking place that kind of gives you all sorts of other information. And that often is in opposition to the words that they're speaking. And that's where the kind of interesting stuff happens. And then I think when you've written things, getting other human beings to read it out loud (laughs) and see whether it actually sounds natural and sounds like something that humans would say. Uh, I'm being sort of slightly facetious in saying humans there, but literally I'll I'll read things sometimes would be like, humans don't speak like that. (laughs) This is not a thing that a human with a human being would say to another human being. And then it's thinking about how you, well, it's thinking about your visual storytelling and how you create the circumstances for subtext to breathe in your dialogue. To illustrate her point, Jess spoke about the 2020 feature film Greenland, starring Gerard Butler, in which a man must save his family after learning that a comet is heading towards the Earth. Gerard Butler 
walks up to a house. We don't know anything about the house. We don't know anything initially about his relationship to the house. As he walks up to the house, there's a child's bike in the driveway, which he picks up and moves to one side in a very familiar way. He then walks up some steps and I think he moves something else. I can't remember exactly what it is, but like a broom or something. And he sort of puts that to to one side. So we know that he's familiar with this house. He knows it really, really intimately. He knows where each of these things go. He's kind of moving without even without even thinking about it. There's a clear familiarity with whoever the child, you know, the owner of the bike is. He gets to the door. He goes to his pocket initially. We assume, obviously, that he's reaching for his keys. He stops and then knocks instead. So all of that has given us that he is familiar with the inhabitants of this house, that he's probably lived in this house, that that there's a child or children in this house that probably he's related to, probably the father of, and that he clearly no longer lives there. So then when a woman answers the door, their interaction, even if I can't remember the exact words that that they say to each other, but even if they both just went hi, that hi is imbued with all of this information that we've been given just in this kind of short little bit of action. So we're suddenly like, oh, they're probably they maybe they were married and they have kids together and you know they're divorced or separated and that's probably really hard and this is really awkward and it must be really difficult for him like walking up to this house that he no longer lives in and how does she feel about that so all of this like you know rich emotional circumstance is suddenly there in high Finally, we asked Jess what questions writers can ask themselves to find their own solutions during the rewriting process how to take notes, and the advice she has for writers currently embarking on a short film script. The question that I always start with whenever I'm working on a new script and that I think is the question that I continue to ask all all the way through the process and that filmmakers should be asking themselves right off the bat and throughout their process is, what am I trying to say? What do I want an audience to understand here um what is the meaning you know if i if you if if i was gonna sit down next to you and be like oh what are you working on at the moment and you say i'm working on this film about blah 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 within that you'd probably be able to articulate what it's about beyond just the events that are on the on the page and if you don't have a clear sense of what it's about that will come through in the script so before even kind of looking in detail at the script, if you are not able to articulate what this film is about, then the, I know for a fact that the script won't be operating as it as it should be. Another thing I think is really useful and important to be thinking about is what is your character's journey? Stories are inherently about change how has your character changed from the beginning to the end what have they gained what have they learned what you know ha- yeah how have they tra- changed or transformed in some way even if it's a sm- even if it's a small change or transformation which it probably will be in a short film because the the degree of change is not as great as it will be in a in a feature necessarily not always but but, ge- but generally speaking so yes what it, how has the how has the character changed it's really important to keep the audience in mind when you're when you're writing. Uh, what effect do you want to have on the audience? And does your script achieve that effect? And that's something that I guess, you, yeah, you'd probably want outside feedback on. It's kind of important that the people reading it are, are you know laugh and find it funny. And if you want them to feel sad, it's important that they're actually feeling sad. So if the script isn't hitting those emotional beats then you need to kind of go back and look at how you're setting those beats up I think when you're getting feedback so there are two two versions of this I guess and this might be before you're in a formal development process and you're getting feedback from peers or friends or family 
So I would say be really careful about whose opinion you're asking for. Make sure that they have some kind of understanding of, of, of what you're trying to do. They like film and, you know, are sort of interested in it. I And I would say be really pointed about what you want feedback on and and ask them specific questions to answer rather than just like, is this good or not? So then the other version of getting feedback would be if you are in a formal development process and you're getting notes from your execs and from a script editor. And if you're a writer, you might get notes from whoever the director is, et cetera, et cetera. So the first thing to say is that everyone gets notes. Getting notes doesn't mean your script is bad and doesn't mean that you're a bad writer. All writers and all scripts will go through a notes process. There are always ways to to push it, to push the script to, you know, better, more exciting, more impactful, more effective places. I'm going to say try not to take it personally. That's obviously a really difficult thing to do because it's like an incredibly vulnerable thing, creating and sharing your 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 work with, with people uh, and sort of putting your heart out on the table for, I don't know, someone to smush up. But it's not it's not personal. It's not a reflection of your ability as a writer. Being able to take notes well is a skill that you'll develop over time. So, you know, it might be really difficult. It might be something that you really, really don't like initially. That's okay. It's a learning process. You'll find you'll find your sort of w- the way that you like to to engage with notes. I think remember that you don't have to take a note. So you, so it, it's fine if you dis if you disagree uh, w- with a note. You don't have to implement a note. But also remember that everyone who's giving you notes has the same goal in mind, which is to make a great film. And I would say if you have a big response to a note or to the note process, I would try not to respond in the moment if you can and to and to take those things on board, you know, whether that's whether that's in the room or whether they, these are these are written notes, take a take a moment, take a, you know, take a couple of days even to sort of process the notes and interrogate within yourself whether do you genuinely disagree with the notes? And is that where your kind of big response ha- has come from? You've heard something that you're like, no, I definitely don't agree with that. That's fine. And that's totally valid. It's just, I would wait to get to that place where you're like, I'm going to dismiss this note because I would want to reflect on sort of two other points within that, which would be, is this note or is this note you know, notes receiving process triggering my self doubt and sense of imposter syndrome. And is that why I'm having a really big response to it? And that's why I'm angry or I'm annoyed or I feel like this person doesn't understand. Is that genuinely something that's coming at you externally? Or is this a lot of sort of internal stuff that's going on for you? And then the other thing I would think about is, has the note been delivered to you in an unhelpful way, in a way (laughs) that makes it sound like you've done a terrible job? And not everyone is really careful about the way that they give notes. It's possible that something has been give, delivered to you in a really, really unhelpful way. It's been worded badly. You can't really see what the note is within that. So yeah, so think about it. Has it been given in an unhelpful way? But if you spend some time with it, will you still find something helpful within it? You can't just want to make a film because you want to make a film and like maybe you'll be famous and it's cool to make a film. It's like, what What have you got to say? What value have you got to bring? How do you want to move people, inspire people? You know, what do you want people to learn about the world that they, that they may not already know about? So make sure that you genuinely have got something to say. And if you don't have something to say this time around, I would say, wait, wait until you know that you have got something to say. And you won't necessarily ha- always have something earth shattering to say, but there's got to be a kind of, nugget of something that you want to communicate to another person you're not creating in a vacuum make sure that you're saying something that's interesting and meaningful usually when i first come up with an idea it's a long protracted process at least for me in my head there are different parts to it there's 
say the I, the idea itself, the story or the character and the emotion that I want to get across, or like maybe there's an image that has really struck me that has come into my head or a device that I want to use in the way that I'm telling something. And those might all come from different places. And it's more of waiting for my brain to finally find a way to fit them all together without realising that's what I wanted to do. The voice you're hearing now belongs to Ed Cripps, a London-based writer by way of Yorkshire and Dorset. He was recently one of 12 writers selected for the Channel 4 screenwriting course for 2022. He has a BFI flair times BAFTA crew mentee, a BFI network at London Film Festival alumni, and has written shorts with the support of the Uncertain Kingdom, the Southern Exposure Film Fund, and BFI Network. You're about to hear him discuss where he gets his ideas from, how he assesses if he's the right person to tell a story, and perhaps come up with a new take on the old adage, write what you know, which is write what you felt. A lot of my ideas come from uh, reading, and I read a lot of articles and watch a lot of things, and so it, they tend to come from things that I'm pretty angry about, and or afraid of, or just interested in, and and eventually something will stick, and I have a a sort of archive of all the articles that and podcasts and things that I've listened or read, listened to or read that I save. And every once in a while, if I'm stuck, I'll sort of skim through those and see if something jumps out. And uh, that's just so that I don't have to rely on my brain so much. And then usually whatever sticks around is something that at least subconsciously I'm, I think could work or is interesting. Although sometimes it can be different if you're working with a director, especially for a short film, the process has been a lot faster because you're bouncing ideas off each other. I think it's important for writers all the time to be asking why you're telling a particular story for, in any case, separate from ideas around representation uh, in storytelling, because you've got to know why you're telling a story. But I think it's important to find something that is personally and emotionally meaningful to you something that exposes or explores something that you've felt uh, not necessarily experienced Um, because I think it's important to have some sort of skin in the game that you're being vulnerable in some way that's important so that it feels emotionally true for my very first things that I wrote and they were terrible plays about me being a stroppy teenager in my family and yes a lot of that had to do with my experience of being a stroppy gay teenager in the closet you then start to learn that you can apply things that you've felt or um, yeah emotions that you've felt or experiences that you've had to stories that run in parallel to your own and I think for any idea you want to talk it through with a range of people even if to just get outside of your head about something and I'm a big fan of research uh, any script you're writing you should enjoy making yourself an expert in what you're talking about but then also it's very important to talk to the people that might be dealing with or experiencing things you're writing about um so in previous short film projects uh, the director and I have talked to charities that uh, work with the, some of the protagonists of the shorts that we've done I think it's important to make sure that you're not stepping on someone else's toes in a way that is sort of more about you than it is about the story. So I think it's important to always approach everything you're doing with respect, self-awareness as well, because um, it's easy to get excited about an idea and then not consider the human implications of the story you're telling. In the next section, you'll hear Ed give his perspective on how you see if something is watertight, if it's working, if it's doing the thing you want it to do, and if not, how you change that. It can be really hard to know how effective a scene or a script as a whole even is working objectively, because at least for me, I get very in, in my head and the way and I can only see something from my perspective. So anything that gets me out of my head uh, and almost pretending that I'm to- that I'm someone totally new coming to the script or the story really helps me and obviously as well what is very helpful is getting other people's opinion um, because you'll have a very narrow view of what you're trying to achieve and not necessarily being able to see what is actually coming across something that helps me with with writing or especially with rewriting is at least in the way that my dyslexic brain works is to me, there's a difference to reading something that I've written and actually 
turning on the, the, the projector of it in my brain and seeing it play out as a short TV episode or a film. And so sometimes there's just that little step that I'll try and tell myself, which is play this as if it's really happening and you're watching it on TV. And then just saying that to myself gives me a, a slight bit of distance and reminds me as well that that's ideally the medium that the product's going to end up as. It's very easy to get caught up in the script that you've written. <laughs> I think always thinking about the end medium that you're aiming for is helpful. Something that Ed is familiar with is the application process and how tricky that can sometimes be. We asked him to offer advice for how to write persuasive applications and also how to deal with rejection when things don't go your way. Writing applications for schemes or for funding is really difficult. It's analogous to writing, or often is, writing pitches or treatments for something that you see as a script. And that is an overlapping but slightly different skill set. And it's very difficult, especially perhaps as a if you're someone who's a writer rather than a writer-director or a producer, it's a difficult sort of separate hat to put on. But I think practice is very helpful. I think something that's helped me is to think about what my personal narrative is. And that sounds really pretentious, and I guess it is. And sometimes filling in application forms can feel excruciating because you're having to sell yourself or talk about something traumatic in exchange for money, essentially, it can feel like. What I mean is it's helpful to know where you're at with your career or even with this just this particular project to, and so that you can show where, how you've gotten to the place where you're at now, the momentum you've built of your own back, of your own initiative, and then the hurdles that you're facing next or the elements that are missing and then how this particular scheme or funding you're applying to can help fill that gap. I think that shows people that are reading applications how they can help you. What experiences do you think you don't have yet? What experiences do you worry that you can't see a path to? And if you tell people what you're about, where you're at, what you've been up to, where, where you hope to be, those that gives them a clear story for them to then insert themselves into, hopefully with some money. <laughs> but it's a lot of self-interrogating and all of it is done for free and everything is very competitive. So I would also advise everyone to try and have some healthy distance from applications as well, if you can, because they're not the be all and end all. You can sometimes feel like a bit of a glutton for punishment applying to various schemes, especially the ones that come around every year. And you think, oh, here's this scheme again. Can't wait to get the rejection email in X week's time. But I think something that has helped me, both just in terms of feeling more organised, but also to get some perspective is to just is to make a spreadsheet. And I'm not uh, spreadsheet inclined. I'm not good with numbers at all. But <laughs> I've learned to love my spreadsheet of projections <laughs> because it shows me that one thing is just one thing of many. And it shows me the, the, the schemes that I have gotten into and been very fortunate to be selected for are usually things that I've applied to at least three times before. And that can that can sometimes mean three, four years consecutively, or or and then I can see years where maybe I wasn't able to put together an application. And that can be depressing, but I think it's also been helpful, even if I don't get selected for anything, to see the progress that I've made. Rejection is a massive part of filmmaking or writing or directing. It's healthy to have a somewhat of a water off a duck's back attitude <laughs> uh, just for your own sanity. And also, if you can, saving your previous applications so that you can look back and think, oh, God, I'm such an idiot saying that. Or, oh, I'm, or I, I've made loads of progress in this aspect or, or this idea is stuck around. So it's clearly something that I really want to write about. Keeping all those records is really helpful. A lot of uh, applications ask for uh, or schemes or opportunities that ask for things that are new or bold or challenging. And that's great. But I think it can also, there's the danger of trying to do something shocking for the sake of it isn't helpful. 
I think it's good to approach any story, or perhaps just in my case, what I try to do is think about what issue or what theme I want to interrogate and think about why I've been circling around that question or character and what my emotional response is and thinking about how I can provoke that response or challenge that response in other people. I think in terms of taking risks or being subversive, I think perhaps the best way to do that is to just figure out how to write something in the most you way possible. But I think through reading a lot, through watching a lot, through talking to other people, meeting lots of different kinds of people, anything that puts new creative food in your brain gives you stuff to digest and to reconfigure in your own way. And by reading a lot, I think, and watching a lot and being aware of what's going on in film or short films can be helpful so that you can double check that you're that you are being progressive you're being additive rather than repetitive thank you for listening to shorthand look out for a new episode next week all about directing and writing the director's statement part of the short film fund application and thank you also to our guests this week lucy bryden jess jones and ed cripps Shorthand is a BFI Network and Film Hub Southeast podcast produced by Nicole Davis with support from the BFI Network and ICO team. Special thanks to our editor Graciela Mechico and Epidemic for the music. <laughs>